1212, I go by the name of DJ Wood, and you're now listening to the original Jeek Podcast. Let's go! Ready to make an entrance, so backwards cut. What up, Jeeks? My name is Rockin' Mr. Magic, and this is the original Jeek Podcast, the best conversation you'll have on sports and geek culture. Welcome, one and all, to the show. I had a wonderful time last week talking about The Mandalorian, episodes one and two of season three. If you missed that episode, check it out. You can go to Spotify. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, almost anywhere you get podcast content. Check that episode out. Let me know what you think of my thoughts, your boy, Rockin' Mr. Magic, of The Mandalorian, and come back to this episode because we're going to be talking about episode Trey of season three. But let's start with a little, what are you, PWC? So today, when we're talking about PWC and what it'll be playing, watching, and or creating, uh, I've actually been playing a little bit more than I had. Uh, Had a little extra free time in my hands. And with that, I'm jumping back into some games I hadn't really spent a lot of time in. Uh, My mainstay of Destiny 2 is still the primary game I've been playing. And I've been a little bit more up to date you know, with my content and keeping up with what's going on in the seasons. I was a little frustrated last season, end of the last uh, update, because the newest one, Lightfall, dropped beginning of this month. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to keep up my streak of the uh, moments of triumph, triumph or seal or title uh, that I had a couple years running from 2020 2021 this one even though it ha- happened in 2023 it's it was moments of trial 2022 and i was not able to get all of the requisites to get that title i did get enough to get another t-shirt which uh i have the uh 2021 t-shirt right over here um but you know i did get enough to get that so i might i might get the shirt even though i didn't get the title and honestly, the shirt's kind of my favorite part of that title, but I, I did want to get the title. But a little disappointed in myself in that. But back in two more of a Destiny, Destiny Groove, I uh, decided to pick up uh, a little bit more No Man's Sky. Uh, I knew there was an exp- exp- yeah, I knew there was an expedition going on. So I just started the expedition actually today um, with two weeks left. So I hope to have a little uh, fun doing that. And honestly, as much as I like No Man's Sky, the expeditions are like the main thing that I play because after being the story and there's only so much of the exploring that feels fresh and cool when you go to different planets and the same three alien races are around, um, you know, you mine stuff, the side quests that you get from the uh, the anomaly are all kind of rinse and repeat, uh, which after a while just doesn't seem as fun, unfortunately. And I like the game, but it doesn't have a tremendous draw as far as re- repeating the content and doing the content over again. But I do like it, so I'm glad to be back into playing it and having something fresh to do. Uh, I'm thinking about streaming on Twitch, um, which is you know, my Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash Rocky Mr. Magic. Um, I'm thinking about streaming some Mass Effect. 
because uh, I've never beaten the game. And y'all may want to crucify me for that. And I'm sorry, but I've never beaten Mass Effect. I did play it on PS3 uh, and was enjoying what I was doing, but I've never beaten it. And I have Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3 that I've never beaten the first one or finished the first one. And I haven't played 2 or 3 yet. So uh, I'm thinking to kind of get back into my Twitch groove as well to jump back into it with with mass effect and give my chance myself a chance to uh to really enjoy that story especially with the story driven rage with uh what i've been watching in the last of us um you know fantastic game show was very good too um i have some things i didn't like about the show but they're they're not major, but just some things I think could have been better. Uh, but all in all, I did enjoy the, watching The Last of Us. Uh, I've also been watching The Mandalorian, clearly, because I've been reviewing it on this show here. And I'm looking forward to starting uh, Ted Lasso Season 3. Ted Lasso Season 3 dropped not too many days ago, so I'm looking forward to watching that. And I also watched Episode 1 of Monster Factory on Apple TV Plus, which is a show um, about a progressing school close close to here. Um, it's in New Jersey, uh, Paulsboro, New Jersey. And for those who live locally within my area, there is a local kid who actually drives out there and trains there. Uh, so, and he actually uh, goes by Guaranteed Mike Z. Um, he actually appeared on an episode of Breaking Ring Rust, our wrestling podcast here by Jeek Nation. So definitely, um, if you're uh, if you're a pro wrestling Jeek, check out Monster Factory. I'd love to know what y'all think about this show. Um, and I'm thinking about maybe talking about it on Breaking Ring Rust, but we'll see what comes of that. But so far for now, that's what I've been PWCing. I want to know what you've been playing, watching, or creating lately. Let me know, and especially share it if you're a member of the Jig Nation Discord or our Facebook community group. Speaking of which, I just have to say this. Um, so those who live by me locally know that I do, uh, may or may not know, I should say, that I work security um, you know, on the side for a little extra dough. And Saturday night, Saturday night. Yeah, Saturday night. I'm at the club and I uh, had a little situation with the chick and her dude in the men's bathroom. And they weren't getting freaky or nothing like that. But um, she was for the streets and he was confronting her, long story short. But as I'm outside, you know, in the bathroom area, the brother walks up to me and was like, yo, what's good, Jeek? And I'm like, did I mishear him? Because now I'm in a club. It's loud. Music's pumping. But no, I didn't mishear him. He recognized me, even though we never met in person, from the Jeek Nation community group. And so shout out to Jeek Nation community member Aaron Guzman for inviting him into the group so that he saw me in the street and recognized me. And it seems like, from what I can tell, he enjoys his time in the community. So shout out to Aaron Shout out to old boy that shouted me out at the club. I didn't even get the brother's name, but I want to shout you out and hopefully be able to interact with you more in the group. And I uh, hope you also enjoy listening to the original Jeek podcast here. All right, let's move on to some quick hits. Quick hit number one for today. The NBA and the NBA Players Association are reaching an agreement on set games for awards. So what does that mean? That means there's going to be a minimum game threshold that is a requisite for regular season awards, such as MVP, Defensive Player of the Year, Rookie of the Year, and et cetera. Uh, well, both sides are in agreement about the concept. They haven't determined the amount of games that's going to be required. Now, for those who don't know already, the NBA already has a rule in place that you've got to appear in at least 
at least 58 games to be eligible for statistical honors, such as the scoring title. Now, for awards like MVP, DPOI, et cetera, which are considered you know, a higher threshold, um, it seems likely the league side, at least, would push for a higher number than that 58. Uh, my guess, and what I think would be fair, barring, you know, for like small injuries, I think someone who plays 70 of 82 games should be eligible for MVP, Defense Player of the Year, etc. Because um, I think that's, I think that gives enough leeway for if someone is too sick to play they are injured uh and they're not like seriously injured they're like well they have like a, a broken pinky and they need to be out a week and while that sets and they're gonna you know it's still broken after a week but some players not as many today to play through that but historically players will dislocate a finger or maybe break a, make, break a finger that is not super vital uh, to their, their shooting, for example. Um, I think Kobe had broken like a left pinky one time and he's right-handed, you know, played with it. Um, and that's just an example. Um, back in the day, Bernard King had dislocated middle fingers on each hand, played in the playoffs, dropped a 50-plus on my Pistons, unfortunately, while he had the flu. But, you know, <laughs> which was just a, a fantastic feat um, out of Bernard King. So there, you know, people have played with small injuries, illnesses, and sometimes people have to sit, you know? And so I think 12 games is enough of a buffer for small injuries, nagging injuries, take a day off here and there and still be eligible for those higher honors. Um, 58 games is barely more than half the games. So I think a higher threshold would definitely be be warranted. Uh, that's why I'm saying 70, because 12 games is, uh, you know, more than an, an eighth of, which, yeah, it's more than an eighth of the games. So as you can see, had some technical difficulties, but I'm back here and Continuing with that, as I was saying, uh, the time frame for playing that I was mentioning in 70 games, the number I suggested, is pretty much the number that has been the standard for NBA players. Uh, the last time a person won the MVP that played less than 70 games was Bill Walton. So the standard for 40 years has been a 70 game or more season played for someone to win a big trophy. It's just now the NBA and the player association are trying to make it official, which should be done. There should be clear rules because we have so much debate around what makes an MVP, what qualifies for a defensive player of the year and having Set qualifications is important. You know, this Jokic and B debate where last year it, when Jokic won, it didn't matter that his team wasn't playing well. This year, people were saying, well, his team's got the best record in the West. Well, last year you said that didn't matter. So now it matters. The, you know, the goalposts keep moving. So having some more set specific guidelines to eliminate who can be eligible and who cannot be is I think a really good thing for the NBA, for the voters and for the fans who appreciate these end of year awards. Next quick hit. Killmonger. Yes. Killmonger. Michael B. Jordan. He wants to, well, he wants to kill free time. He wants to kill the free time of new anime fans. He was recently asked uh, to share his recommendations for new fans to, to anime. And at first, you know, he kind of ducked the question, but then he gave a list. And this list is 
not in any particular ranking. This is just the list as spoken by Michael B. Jordan after being pressed on what anime he would recommend. He said, and I quote, One Piece, Dragon Ball Z, Naruto, Bleach, and Hunter Hunter. And then added on, that's a pretty good starting five. Mm, wrong. That's a great list. Those are all great anime. Those are all anime that I recommend people to watch. I would not recommend those being starting anime. New to anime? You're you're new to this thing? I I'm not recommending. I, I'm just I'm not recommending those five. With the maybe ex- the one exception of Dragon Ball Z, because Dragon Ball Z is so so ingrained into anime culture, especially in the United States and Western uh, countries, there is a lot of Dragon Ball Z culture being Dragon Ball Z being immersed into pop culture. That it is could be the one exception. Now, there's a lot of episodes in Dragon Ball Z, but. It's such an integral anime that I can see making a more specific recommendation, like telling someone, okay, um, watch the Earth series, the Earth saga, or the Frieza saga, or the Cell saga, like just to give them a frame, a starting point. Not because if you just say just watch Dragon Ball Z, well, that is, that's a lot. I don't need to reiterate the same for One Piece. One Piece is insanely long. Now, Ruto is also very long. A ton of filler episodes. Bleach is also pretty lengthy. And Hunter x Hunter has also got a pretty good length to it. Um, it's a, shorter than some of the others, but it's, it's, not, it's not a short anime. It's not a one or two season anime that, you know, is a starter. It's great. I, it's, I don't consider that anywhere near being a starter anime. Um, because there's so many different animes, there's so many genres within anime. You've got shonens, you've got your, you know, your romance, your slice of life. You've got sports anime. Um, there's just so many different options to choose from that knowing who you're recommending to is what I would do if you're recommending anime uh if you have a friend who's into sports and you think they would appreciate sports anime recommend a sports anime you know recommend uh diamond oase or big wind up uh i21 i shield 21 if they're uh you know american football fan uh i mean there's there's diving anime swimming anime um hajime no ipo for for boxing anime there's just so many different options that you can go with that you can find, you know, subgenres within the sports anime genre. Uh, th- there's just tons to choose from. So I would recommend if you're an anime fan and you're trying to recommend anime using a little bit more thought than just going with the big names. And this is not a knock on Michael B. Jordan. It's just I would not recommend any of those outside of Dragon Ball Z to be an intro point for, for anime. Next, next quick hit. Um, Resident Evil 4 dropped yesterday uh, of this recording. Now, originally I started recording pre-drop, but hey, what it is. Uh, but I'm hyped for Resident Evil 4. Who else is hyped? Who, who has copped? Who's copped RE4? And if you have, I want to hear about it. I want to... You share either in the G Nation Discord, share in our Facebook community. I want to know how it looks, how it plays, how hyped you are for the game, because I plan on copping whenever I can. Uh, as a big Resident Evil fan, I'm really excited to to get this game. I just I just can't do it right now. But I want to know what your Resident Evil 4 remake experience has been so far. Tag your boy, Rocky Mr. Magic, in posts, comments, Discord, or uh, the Facebook community. And, of course, there are links to both in the show's description. Next. Next quick hit. 
Ken Griffey Jr. Now, with the World Baseball Classic recently ended, um, and Ken Griffey being on the coaching staff, there was a video of Ken Griffey Jr. taking BP, and oh my God, it was so sweet. He's That swing hasn't gone anywhere. It's still so smooth and so beautiful, but this quick hit is not about Ken Griffey Jr.'s amazing swing or the World Baseball Classic. It is about Ken Griffey Jr. and payroll. Yes, payroll. Ken Griffey Jr., as of right now, is the third highest paid Cincinnati Red in 2023. No, no, really, seriously. Ken Griffey Jr. is the third highest paid player on the Cincinnati Reds roster. At 53 years old, and the man hasn't played since 2000 in Cincinnati, since 2008. I don't remember what year exactly he retired, but he left the Reds in 08. The man hasn't played for the Reds since 08. And they are still paying him. Yes, he's going to make about $3.6 million, just shy of $3.6 million in 2023 from the Cincinnati Reds. And that's just, honestly, what this says to me is that baseball agents are the GOAT. They're the GOATs. Because these deferred contracts that they keep doing, we all know about Bobby Bonilla Day. You know, like everybody knows about Bobby Bonilla Day. We laugh at the Mets fans and the Mets every year uh, when it's Bobby Bonilla Day and Bobby gets his check because of the amazing agent work that, that Bobby's agent did to get that deferred salary and keep the guy getting paid till he's like 75. Like, it's, it's crazy. But the fact that there are other deferred contracts out there like Ken Griffey Jr.'s, and I'm sure there are others that we don't know about because Bobby's is just like the big example. These these agents, these baseball agents are the GOATs. The fact that they can keep getting their clients paid by deferring salary all these years, meaning it's the players are getting this consistent payment, the agents are getting their cut, and it has to benefit the team somehow to defer these payments. I don't know if they save on taxes or if they save on the – I don't know. Baseball cheeks, you're going to have to confirm for me if – Major League Baseball has a luxury tax or not. I know the NBA has a luxury tax um, because they have a soft cap. I believe the NFL does as well. Um, But I don't know if Major League Baseball has a luxury tax. I don't don't know why they would because they don't have a salary cap. But if they do have a luxury tax, let me know. Because I'm trying to figure out what the benefit for these teams are to defer these salary payments. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't understand how it helps the team, but apparently it helps the teams because they do it and they've done it for other players. So there's got to be a benefit for everybody to have this extended payment win, win, win. Is that three? Win, win, win. Yeah, that's three. Triple win. Win for the player, win for the agent, win for the team by having these deferred payments. Like, it's it's wild. So shout out to Ken Griffey Jr. for still getting paid in 2023 from Major League Baseball. Shout out to his agent, broker the deal and you know shout out to the teams who are saving somehow or making out by these deferred salary payments amazing all right so we're going to go to the main event of this episode and that is the mandalorian season three episode three and if I could squeeze it in, because again, the original recording did not happen, had some technical difficulties, maybe episode four. But let's start with episode three, The Convert. So, um, oh, before I jump into it, um, I'm going to give a non spoiler rating of this episode. Um, honestly, I have to give this episode a three point. Two, um, I I can't give it really much higher than that. It's not, and now in the spoilers, I'll explain why. But I liked the episode, but I didn't love it. And there were some things that I thought were just completely unnecessary. So 
I shouldn't say none. Yeah. No, there were things I thought were unnecessary. Um, and just the episode gave uh, through a curveball. Actually, not even a curveball, like a slurve, a slider slash curve. Like it, I didn't see this coming. Um, and I'm unsure of where it's going to take the story and what it's going to really do for the story. So uh, I give this a 3.2. 3.2 out of 5 is my ranking. As we rate things on a five point scale around here, we got five on it, y'all. 3.2 out of 5 for episode 3, season 3, The Convert of the Mandalorian. All right, so now you're entering a spoiler zone. You are officially warned I will be spoiling episode 3. So if you have not watched episode 3 yet and you don't want to be spoiled, well, this is the time to start listening to this podcast and go watch it because there's nothing after this um, for you to move forward to. So... If you don't want it spoiled, thank you for listening. Pause, go watch, and come back. All right, here we go. Episode three starts off really great. Um, it starts off right after how episode two ended, which uh, in the right outside the waters, the living waters in the mines of Mandalore, after Bo Katan rescued Din Djarin out uh, from tumbling or being pulled. I can't tell which. Um, I think they kind of left that ambiguous, but we know he was sucked in or fell in deep into the waters there and Bo-Katan pulled him out. And we start right off there. Mando's lying flat on his back. You know, Bo-Katan's tired. She's sitting there. Mando, you know, he gets up. They, she's like, you all right? He's like, yeah, I'm good. She's like, all right, we, you know, it's time. Let's go. Let's get out of here. Mando takes like a test tube, fills up with water to show proof that he was in the living waters. Um, as he's kind of getting ready, bo asks him um, if he saw anything as a as he went down. He's like, no, I didn't see anything. He's like, you sure you didn't see anything alive? And he's like, alive? No, I didn't see anything alive. If you recall, bo as she was jetpacking Mando out, she saw a massive creature that looked at her, was pretty uninterested. Um, but we assume that it is the uh, legendary mythosaur that bo saw. And, of course, there's a prophecy that the rise of mythosaur will herald the rise and return of new Mandalore and new Mandalorian age. So bo not being one for, you know, myths and tales, and she doesn't walk the way, you know, she doesn't follow the creed the way, uh, the children to watch that men was a part of do. She's kind of skeptical of those things, you know, removes her helmet all the time. Uh, she's she, uh, visibly shaken to as well as someone who is in a helmet can be visibly shaken. But we can, you can tell, and shout out to Katie Sackhoff for being able to portray it um, in a helmet, kind of how Pedro Pascal and the... Uh, Others do when they're in the helmet portray uh, emotions by, you know, nonverbal gestures, head notes, tods, you know, body language. Her body language definitely exuded um, being shaken by what she saw in the in the mines there. In the waters, in the mines. So uh, they they get to bo ship, they're flying back to her moon, and they get intercepted by TIE Interceptors. Not TIE Fighters, but Interceptors. Um, if you don't know, the Interceptors have, the TIE Fighters have the, um, they look like the little bow ties, they have the flat panels on each side. The Interceptors have their side panels that are angled, so like if you put them together, it would be a, a hexagon. But they look a little cooler. Um, kind of like the one Darth Vader was flying uh, in A New Hope compared to the TIE fighter that had the flat sides. Um, and the interceptors are tougher to take out. And so they're getting chased. They're pretty close to the moon where bo lives. And Mando's like, get get us there. I can back you up in my N1. Uh, they do so. Mando, um, they get to the moon. Mando jumps out. Does that like a, kind of like a free fall parachute thing like in Star, like in the Star Trek 2009 movie. Um, he ends up getting to the M1, and then they have another fantastic Star Wars uh, dogfight scene. This time, 
in the moon's atmosphere. Uh, before I go forward, I have to shout out Star Wars for this particular thing that I think they do the best in, in any sci-fi franchise. People who know me know that I am, I'm, I'm a big Trekkie. I'm always Star Trek over Star Wars. But, man, Star Wars has the best dogfights in sci-fi. They have from the door. They're always good. They're never like a like you never you, they're never boring. Like they're just they're always good and enjoyable to watch. Um, and this is the second one we've had in three episodes, and it doesn't feel stale. Um, they just and and even especially when it involves the Tie Fighters or the tie interceptors, that that noise, that scream, that <laughs> noise that they make, um, you hear it, you know it's coming, you know a tie fighter or a tie interceptor is coming, and that heralds the beginning of, you know, it sets your, your, sets your anticipation for a great space or an atmosphere, you know, dogfight. And dogfight's great. Mando does his thing. Um, Bo Katan, you know, does you know her her thing in her ship. She ends up getting the you know taking out the last one, um, and you just have a just another great scene of a dogfight in Star Wars. And I cannot praise them enough for how well they do dogfights and space battles in Star Wars. They by far are the best at it. Better than you don't see it that many that much in about in um in Star Trek. Star Trek is more big ship to big ship. Um, you don't see like the small dog fights, the small battles. Uh, Battlestar Galactica has some good ones, but Star Wars does it the best. I I can't. There's just no other sci-fi franchise I can think of that does it even close to as good. So pick out pick up the Star Wars, Lucasfilm, Disney for continuing that um, great tradition of fantastic dogfights in sci-fi okay back back to focus uh, out of that rabbit hole um so during this dogfight tie receptors roll through and just bomb the crap out of bo castle completely destroyed so now she has no home so um and she's obviously irritated she's obviously pissed off about it and as they're flying um Mando picks up on his radar. There are more, uh, a whole bunch more of TIE interceptors that are on their way. He's like, we got to get out of here. Bo-Katan is kind of shook. Um, there's a mention that, I think a little earlier, but there was a mention of how many interceptors there were. So it couldn't be like a regular former, you know, Empire warlord. So bo like, no, in this like breathless tone, like she has an idea of who it could be that just, you know, destroyed her place. Um, And a lot of the internet rumors, the major Star Wars nerds are assuming that we're getting a tie-in or a lead-in to uh, Admiral Thrawn. Maybe I'm not that big of a Star Wars nerd to to know that. Um, But if we get that, it's cool. Like, I didn't expect to see Cad Bane in Book of Boba Fett. Like, so you never know who who they'll throw in here. Um, so, you know, we'll see what, what happens with that. So they run. Mando's like, you know, come with me or I'm going to take you to, you know, uh, pretty much our Mandalorian enclave where the children of the Watch are. He's like, it's a secret location, but, you know, I'm taking you here. Um, you know, it'd be best if you keep your helmet on. There'll be less static. So bo kind of is like, kind of huffs about it. She's like, all right, whatever. They get there. And Mando's like, I bathe in the waters. And the armor is like, all right, well, you got proof. And he hands her the uh, test tube. She pours the water into like her, her forges water that she tempers the uh, steel in. It, Ripples green like the waters at the mines, and she's like, "Oh, he speaks the truth. He's been redeemed." Uh, and then the 
not a full surprise, but kind of surprise, is that then the armorer looks at Bo-Katan, says, you know, hey, Bo-Katan, Kreese, um, did you bathe in the water? And she's like, yeah, like I, I pulled him out of the water. And then the armorer's like, did you remove your helmet? And she's like, I haven't removed my helmet since. And she goes, well, then you two are redeemed. And you can stay here with us as long as you like. Welcome. You know, and everybody comes and pats on the shoulder. You know, so this is the way and welcomes her essentially as a part of their, not just their enclave, but as a part of the way. And she says, like, Bo-Katan's like, but I don't walk the way. And, and the armor is pretty much like, well, that doesn't matter because you, right now you're adhering to, you know, the old ways. So you can stay here with us and if you continue to keep those ways and live as your ancestors did, you're you're free to stay with us. So that's pretty much essentially what it looks like Bo-Katan is going to do. And then we have a major shift in this episode where we shift from whatever planet the Mandalorian uh, Anglave is and we shift to Coruscant where we see um, some characters we haven't seen since season one. We see a Dr. Pershing, who was the creepy doctor who was trying to do experiments on Grogu. And we see a communications officer from Moff Gideon's ship. Now, if you don't remember them, make sure you watch the uh, previously on for episode three, um, because I skipped it and I recognized these these actors, um, but I did not remember them all that well. So I was kind of like, why who huh and then as it went on i'm like okay yeah 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 i remember this guy like okay yeah i remember her face yeah and then as i watched i was like okay but what's the point of this okay this is in kind of interesting but what's the point so dr pershing gives a speech about two because he's in the new republic now um And he gives a speech about how his work on cloning was being used for evil and that wasn't his intention. And we discover that he is part of the New Republic's amnesty program for former Imperial officers and workers, as is the former communications officer from Goff, Moff Gideon, Goff Gideon, what's wrong with me? Moff Gideon's ship. And after his speech, he is taken to the amnesty housing section. He uh, meets some other amnesty people, and he sees the young lady from Moff Gideon's ship. Uh, they introduce the, each other as their designations, which is like a letter and a number. So he's like L something something. She's like G something something. And when they see each other, there's immediate recognition and he's like, oh, I'm just surprised to see someone else from Moff Gideon's ship, which was information that the other three guys there did not know. And one of them was like, oh, I didn't know you worked for him and kind of gave her a look of disdain, which I think is, you know, is a little telling um, because they're all former Imperials and, but, you know, getting a look of like, you work for Moff Gideon. Um, that I think that's definitely something that is, supposed to you know be a, be a little bit of a clue that something is you know the people who worked from off Gideon are different you know uh she's like yeah but that's the past you know i'm part of new republic you know rehabilitated all that so because there is you no know, familiarity between the two they end up uh going for glowy popsicles on coruscant and have a cute little conversation um she encourages them to touch the peak of the mountain that's poking up into the city. And it's not a whole lot of it, but it's the only part of the surface you can actually see. Um, and you can't touch it, but she's like, Hey, you can touch it. Go ahead. And then of course a robot, you know, joy comes out and is like, don't touch. And she laughs and, you know, they kind of have a nice, you know, a big ice breaking moment. And as they're talking, you know, she's talking about his work and his research and is like, you know, would it benefit the, the new Republic for you to keep working on it. And he goes, yeah, but you know, we can't do that. And as they continue to talk and such, she's like, you know, Hey, you should really keep working on it. If it's really going to help. And he kind of like, yeah, I know what you mean, but you know, 
I don't think that's what the New Republic wants. So he's working in like a really menial desk job, way below his education and station. And the next day after this conversation, he goes back to work and he's like, you know, I'm doing this work and I see that you've got all this great equipment from the Empire that's just decommissioned to get destroyed. Like, that that's a waste. You know, I, this could be used and I can show the New Republic how this can be used for good. And like his like supervisor's like, no, that's no big deal. You know, don't make waves. And you really shouldn't, uh, really shouldn't do that. Oh, I almost forgot. Um, this is kind of important. So after, while they're, when uh, Dr. Pershing is introduced and uh, bumps into the security officer with the other people, um, the communications officer with the other people, um, they're like sharing like what they missed from their old life. And he shares that he really missed these um, rations, like these yellow colored rations he really liked. And then later on, a box of them mysteriously appears in front of his door. And then he finds uh, later on, so the scene I'm talking about when he goes back to work and he's asking about these, um, this equipment, he had a box, uh, a package of these rations that he really likes um, in his drawer. So the uh, the communications officer is like, look, you know, if, if you want to do your work, I can get you the materials and stuff that you need. Um, and he's like, no, nah, that's, you know, that's not worth it. But as when he goes back to work and he's kind of being told, like, just forget about it and keep on, put your head down and, you know, keep moving forward, it grates on him. He can't do that. And he has... um there's a change in his resolve. So they have a droid that kind of does interviews with them regularly. Um, people in the amnesty program, you know, do you have any bad feelings about the new Republic? Do you have this? Do you have that? And his answers are shorter and there, you can tell there's some agitation, irritation in his voice. Um, and he decides that he's, you know what, he's not going to sit on his thumbs. He's going to, he's going to take action. So he goes to, uh, the communications officer's department is like, hey, let's do this. Let's get, um, I need a mobile lab. Let's get this. Let's do this. And she's like, all right, you know, you're going to have to meet me here. And we're going to have to, you know, uh, be outside of our designated zones and take off our designated apparel. And we're going to do this. So they get on a train. They're not wearing the normal clothes. and they avoid a kind of like a, a droid on the train, jump off, um, share a little bit of a laugh, even though they jump off a crazy fast moving train. And there's a little bit more of a bond, a little bit more trust built between them. Uh, they go on to a Star Destroyer and they have a conversation as they're going through, actually introduce each other, introduce themselves to each other by using their names. So we learn her name is like Ada Kane and he's Dr. Pershing. Um, you know, they shake hands. They find themselves in a room where he finds mobile lab equipment and stuff that they're talking. And while they're talking and gathering this stuff up, um, they kind of hear a noise. And she's like, Kane's like, oh, that's just the ship settling. He's like, oh, okay. And they hear another bang. It sounds like people are there, and she's like, "Oh, you know, it shouldn't be anything, but I'll go. I'll go check it out. I'll go stand watch." They go stand watch. She goes to stand watch. And as they're leaving, they hear footsteps, and then they start running, and they run and they run, and they get outside. And as they're running, they're surrounded by New Republic soldiers who tell them to freeze, put down the equipment, but they're only talking to Doctor Pershing. Uh, they're using his L number designation. Um, Kane then stands in front of him picks up the equipment that he has and walks away. So she set him up. And later he finds himself in a room on a bed. Now they had mentioned this in the conversation. Um, when they first uh, got together. When he first met, re-met her and the other people about uh, being hooked up to a mind flare. Um, that Moff Gideon was hooked up to a mind flare and his brain got melted essentially. And he's hooked up to a mind flare. They call it something else. We're like, no, that's not a mind flare. This is a, you know, something, something. It's not 
this isn't the empire sign word in uh it's one of uh whatever race of like sp- space crawfish that admiral admiral akbar is um and the guy's like oh this is okay we use this i've take i've i've had it happen to me is this just going to help you out it's nothing like the mind flayers that the empire used and he's like no this is a mind flayer and he's he's trying to prove this you don't understand you know i need to talk to him she set me up it was a trap and <laughs> and the uh you know the admiral akbar similar race guy looked to him like bruh you just tell me it's a trap um and that was a nice little piece of uh of, of fan service comedy i really enjoyed that that was that was fun uh a nice little comedic break to the uh, a tense and serious situation um on the other side you know in a uh, viewing area is kane and she's with a guy and she's like look can i stay you know um he's a friend um he's straight but you know i kind of want to be there for him and the guy's like oh yeah not a problem and he turns on the mind flayer to like two or three or something like that and then he leaves and kane's in there by herself and she then reaches down and cranks the mind flare all the way up and Pershing is screaming and she breaks out one of the rations that she had gotten and starts eating it and just walks away as his mind gets f- fried. I don't mind this part of the story that much. If it wasn't for the fact that I am pretty much forgotten these characters and I don't know what this does for the main story of the Mandalorian. My concern is that this is very much like the Mando chapters of the book of Boba Fett that really had nothing to do with Boba Fett um, being placed into this show that's going to move the overall Star Wars story forward, but not necessarily really have much of anything to do with the Mandalorian. Uh, I don't know how much Disney slash Lucas is going to do that, but I'm not a fan if that's how they're going to do it because honestly they could have done that in this episode even using these same characters uh with the same purpose but they spent way too much time on these two characters we haven't seen since season one that we really don't care about we don't have an emotional attachment to them we don't really have much attachment to them at all and yet they were featured prominently in this episode now, one of them is probably dead or his brain's fried. And the other one, we don't know what's going to happen with Kane. But I have a f- sneaking suspicion that she may somehow still be working for Moff Gideon. Um, she may be working for Admiral Thrawn. But I have a sneaking suspicion that she is there undercover, like deep cover. So, like, she's in the MSC program. And she's working for the New Republic and catching, like, people who aren't really reformed and trying to catch people who are really reformed. Um, But she really isn't reformed herself in that she may be exposing people like Pershing and others, either who, because they recognize her from Moff Gideon shipping, you know, loose lips sink ships. And, they, you know, that was the first thing he said when he mentioned when he saw her was that she worked for Gideon. Uh, and I think she may have had him eliminated because she may still be either working for Gideon or other people knowing she worked for Gideon puts her deep cover in danger because then she may be watched more closely than she would be if people didn't know she worked for Gideon. That's just my supposition <laughs> that I get from this. I mean, y- y'all may be thinking, scratching heads, ah, I don't know, Magic, that sounds a little crazy, but I don't think it sounds crazy. Um, I just don't understand why they had to spend so much time on this with these two. Finally, we get back to uh, Mando. And I I mean, I don't mind the Bo-Katan side story becoming a more focal point um, because it has to do with Mandalore. It has to do with Mandalore. um, And it moves the show more along the Mandalorian's past than, you know, Dr. Pershing and communications officer Kane. Um, 
so we get to the end of the episode and essentially we've got Mando, we've got um Bo Katan and they are um they're on the uh at the enclave and they're the position they have um Bo Katan in is you know a position where she can because she's been welcomed she now could potentially utilize the the children of the way um sorry the children of the watch as allies in her bid to uh reclaim being Mandalorian royalty so that's where and that's where the episode ends i know i mentioned that part previously as it all went like one continuous thing um the dr pershing kane story took place between uh the dog fight and arriving at the enclave to uh acknowledge that mando has been redeemed and then also that bo katan has been redeemed so that's where we end with episode three uh, again i ranked it a 3.2 out of five um I didn't dislike the episode. I did like it. It's just the Dr. Pershing and Kane part just took way too much time and way too long where so much more should have been done um, around Bo-Katan and, and Mando. And also the biggest thing before I close this episode, the biggest travesty, which is why it's just 3.2 and not lower. Um, the biggest crime of this episode is the fact that Grogu was non-existent. You have the cutest thing in television in Grogu, and you completely wasted an episode without using him at all. There was no use of Grogu whatsoever in this episode, and that is a crime. Complete and utter crime. So that's my final word on Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 3, The Convert. And that's going to complete this episode of the original Jeek podcast that we made to bless your ear balls. If you enjoy this episode, please let us know. And I want to thank you for listening because we couldn't do this show without you Jeeks who continue to support us. So please rate and review the show on your podcasting app of choice. Uh, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, CastBox, and more. Um, and also now YouTube. YouTube now is supporting uh, podcast. So if you can't find us on any of those, let us know at jeeknation at gmail.com or message us on Facebook at jeeknation. And until next time, peace. Ready to make an entrance, so backwards. Good. Ah, uh, come on, cut for me. Ah, uh, yeah. Whoa, slow down. Uh, 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 Whoa, speed up. <laughs> this is DJ What, and you're listening to the original Jeek. Podcast.